Good afternoon. I'm Colleen Haas and I'm a full-time instructor at Indiana State University in the African and African American Studies program and adjunct instructor at Elizabethtown College in Pennsylvania. I'm joined today by some scholars um, in music in Africa and the African diaspora, especially African American music. Uh, this interview is conducted on Zoom and will be archived on my YouTube channel, Lectures in Ethnomusicology. This afternoon, I will be interviewing Dr. Austin Akifo and Dr. Tyron Cooper. And I'll just give you a quick background on um, both of these gentlemen here. So um, Dr. Austin Okibo is an associate professor in the College of Music and affiliate faculty in ethnic studies and global health at the University of Colorado in Boulder. He received his PhD in ethnomusicology and African studies from Indiana University Bloomington and his master's is in sacred music and music education from Westminster Choir College. He has degrees also in philosophy and theology from the Pontifical Urban University in Rome. His research focuses on religious music, musical diasporas, global health, and interreligious and intercultural dialogues. Um, Mr. Okibo is a, an active scholar in the Society of Ethnomusicology and African Studies. He's been featured in a number of local and international radio and television programs, including BBC, Channels TV Lagos, Nigeria, Black Radio Consortium, and contributor and analyst on the entertainment in, in, industry and cultural education and policy. He is author of the book, Music, Culture, and the Politics of Health, Ethnography of a South African AIDS Choir. He has other uh, numerous um, articles that he has published, and he's also, uh, uh, what should we say, teaches vocal ensembles, and he is also a vocalist himself. Dr. Tyron Cooper is a five-time Emmy Award winner and is the director of Indiana University's Archives of African American Music and Culture. He is also an associate professor in the Department of Folklore and Ethnomusicology at Indiana University. He holds a bachelor's degree in music education from Bethune-Cookman University, as well as a master's in jazz studies and PhD in ethnomusicology, both from Indiana University. Dr. Cooper's research focuses on black popular and religious music and specifically live gospel music recording productions as mediated products. Along with his teaching and research in African American music, Cooper is recognized for his extensive studio recording and live performance experience. He is a composer. He's garnered five Emmys and one Telly and several Emmy nominations for his music in ESPN and eight PBS documentaries. Thank you for being with me with this forum today. I'm very grateful to have you with us and let's go ahead and get started. I have some questions for you and I'm looking forward to your responses. So to begin, I was wondering if the two of you could please address the importance and magnitude of vocal music in Africa and or uh, African descendants in the United States. Okay. My brother, would you like to go first? Or? Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, the vocal music is very important, very important because for various factors, um, Kofi Agau, for instance, have, has written about this. There is the tendency when we talk about African musicology for people to use the parameters of Western art music as a way of measuring and understanding what happens in other musical cultures, which is flawed when you do it that way. Um, Kofi argues, for instance, that music in Africa is tied to language. And if music is tied to language, then the, the fundamental of musicality and musician, musical creativity begins with the voice. And it is for this very reason, if you think about it, that we have in Africa, we have several, especially in West, West Africa and Central Africa, you have several instruments that have come to be defined or even termed talking drums. For instance, there are several of such talking drums. These are instruments that tend to mimic speech patterns. 
So, and the implication is that um, when people perform music, whether they are singing, playing strings or playing percussion instruments, be them membrane of phones or slit drums in the idiophone category, they are not just producing rhythms. Although Western scholarship has also tried to preoccupy themselves with reading when it comes to African music, which is again flawed, thanks to Eric von Homboster, right? Because in actual performance of music, there is communication, there is speech, there is, you know, so, so whether it is in melody or uh, polyrhythm, as all these are Western terminologies or languages that are being used. Vocal music is a fundamental. The implication is that when you take away drums, for instance, or percussion or other instruments, it does not prohibit musicality among Africans. And this has this is part of what happened when African Americans, you know, slaves, African slaves were brought here. Um, Africa, you know, slavers in the South, especially after the Stonewall Rebellion um, in the 17, early 1700s, thought, you know, created, you know, in, enacted some of what would come to be known as a slave codes, which included the prohibition of drums and loud instruments because they thought those had communicative ability. And that was part of how the slaves were able to rally uh, their, their communities in the rebellion. Um, but Bernice Reagan Johnson says, you can take away the drumming, but you cannot take away the drum. But the fundamental you see in all in these histories that I have given, and these analyses I've given, brief as it is, is it shows you why vocal music, voice, I would say voice is very prevalent, very significant, very important in African music, because whether you're singing or playing an instrument, there is always what is fundamental to all of that is language and communication. I love that. I love that what you were saying, Austin. I am thinking about the idea of around articulation. Um, it brings to my mind, you know, what are we articulating? What are we actually saying with the music? Uh, I think it was Ingrid Monson's book, Saying Something, when she wrote on this jazz community and thinking about what you are actually saying, this kind of social musical, the uh, social political, the social cultural connections, the so social cultural artic articulations around music. Uh, one of the things I would have uh, someone to walk away from our brief discussion about what the takeaway is from the voice and that that speaks to its significance uh, is that the idea of the voice or singing is a reflection of liberty amongst uh, Black folk, particularly in Afri African Americans in the United States. Uh, it is through the singing voice that articulations of agency, consciousness, uh, rebellion, and even and even triumph uh, are expressed. I, I would believe I, I would say to the greatest degree. Um, when other kinds of expressions are and have been and continue to be either limited or rather non-accessible uh, uh, to African-Americans. Uh, I'd also want to suggest that the voice uh, as you articulated does not act alone. Uh, oftentimes when people think about singing in the African-American tradition, you look at, you know, one person might be standing on stage, but they're not standing alone. They're not articulating alone in the sense of what accompanies them. You talked about the Stonewall Rebellion and how they took away the drums, but the drum comes from within. The articulations, the beat, uh, the ethos of the drum comes within. We still, in other words, have the rhythm. The rhythm is in our body. The rhythm is at the core of our being. We are the drum, essentially, right? So whether it be through body movement, hand clapping, foot stomping, whether it be the accompaniment of the Hammond B3 organ or in hip hop, 
uh, the loop, there's a certain accompaniment to the voice that the voice does not act alone when we think about it from an artistic uh, practice uh, standpoint. And then, you know, the voice, even if it sings alone is, I would say like the blues is, uh, it maintains a link to the black plight. It maintains a link. When I sing my songs, uh, the community either wails or it praises and all in between. Uh, pinning the sonic reflections that I uh, that I express at any given time. So the song is organically tied to the community. The voice is a reflection of the communal sentiment, the communal experience. The voice is significant and the voice is able to articulate these ideas that interestingly enough, are not normally acceptable if we just speak. But it's something about seeing that transcends uh, boundaries. Uh, we've been able to do that since in, in, in the United States in terms of documented Black religious music from the Negro spirituals to gospel music all the way up to hip hop. Uh, uh, pop music, jazz, rhythm and blues, soul, funk, all of these musical styles and genres carry with them the voice of the people, whether it is a solo singer or a collective unit. So the voice is very significant. Yeah. And if I may add a little bit more, since this is supposed to for each follow up on each question should be a little bit more conversational. Um, so Dr. Cooper, talk about the voice of the, the collective. The collective is also very important there. A follow-up question you posed there is what's what's you know what attributes or aesthetics are highly valued for leaders or everyday folks within vocal music expression? What kind of status? So if you look at different whether it's in the on the continent or in the diaspora, be it in blues, be it in um uh, calypso, um, reggae music, uh, aspects of the diaspora. The, the vocalist, the person who is a, a vocalist is not just somebody who happened to have a good voice, but actually somebody who understands the story of the community. And you find these among, so for instance, among the jelly of um, the Mande speaking peoples of West Africa. The jelly is known as the owner of the world. He knows the history of the Horono, the leadership group and the warrior class. He's see the again Western mis, mis misapplication of concept. We they tend to call them praise singers. They are not praise singers. They are historians. They are custodians of history. They they can in their performance, they praise you if you are a leader. If you are doing well, if they are happy with you, they castigate you. They repudiate you through performance also if they think you're not doing well. So that's a press singing is, is an anomaly. Mm -hmm. And it is somebody who are supposed to understand what is happening in the community and who can evaluate current experiences of the people in light of their history. That's why also when you look at Calypso, the Chantwell, who is a lead vocalist, is known to be somebody who some people say he is the newscaster because when you're listening to Calypso in the extemporaneous performance of Calypso in its traditional form, you get the latest news of what is happening in society. You get to understand who is behaving how. In African-American community during, uh, there's, there used to be something that was called the, the institution of putting on the banjo. The banjo is an instrument, but the institution of putting on the banjo was an activity that happened once a year when in neighborhoods, using the instrument 
as a lead, as central to the musical activity, they will go around shaming people who have behaved badly in the community, which was a way of social control, a way of making sure that maintaining certain value system, a certain type of morality and ethics in the society. Therefore, the vocalist is not just somebody who can sing well um, to entertain people, but his voice is the voice of the community. Yeah. I love that, Dr. Okibo. I, uh, you say some couple of words, but one in particular, the, the good voice. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Uh, we got to be really conscious, I think, to understand from whom's perspective is it good? Uh, how how is it evaluated? How is the voice evaluated? How has it been evaluated historically? Mm -hmm. In in terms of cultural outsiders assessing the African and the African derived voice, we've heard it in the past. It's in journals, it's in letters, it's it's all over the place in writing. It's documented that uh, our musics have been called, our voice has been called uh, uh, ugly, disjointed, fragments, and, uh, uh, de facto ugly, the uh, 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 out of tune, not in tune with A440, right? Uh, they. Oh, oh, you're not, you're not, you're sharp, you're flat. Out of so it doesn't coincide with Western European ideals or criteria of what is beautiful. So here we're dealing with two different aesthetic traditions. Yeah. Right? Which point to everything that you just got through saying, not just in terms of sound or tonality, but it points to the meanings behind the voice, the utterances in the voice. When James Brown grunts, when mm -hmm. he falls, when he hollers, it's not just hollering. He's articulating an experience. He's articulating uh, the disillusionment of African-Americans in the late 60s and early 70s. He's articulating the cries. Uh, the beauty comes from what Langston Houston, uh, the great poet, talked about in 19, I think around 1951, laughing to keep from crying. Mm -hmm. The black voice <clears throat> has a tendency to bring joys during joy during blues moments. Mm -hmm. But if you don't understand how to articulate the sentiments of the community, then that's when your voice is de facto not good. Mm -hmm. Right. So the good voice in our community in our community understands the plight of the of the plight of the community, the 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 nuanced lived experience. And, and is able to give that out in certain qualitative ways that meet the expectations of the Black audience. That's the good voice. And that's that's very, it's important, of course, to emphasize our, I would say, the issue of aesthetical differential cannot be overemphasized. Um, of course, uh, talking about issue of ethnocentrism, again, one of the things um, that people like Humboldtel did in writing about African music is that they interpreted everything through the lens of Western music. It's for that very reason that he made that very statement that has carried on even up to now that Africans um, experience and express music through rhythm, whereas Westerners express, experience and express music through melody and harmony um, because he doesn't hear melody in African drumming, not neither does he hear harmony. And that's part of the problem. So, but again, even in terms of vocality, whether your voice as, as, as vocal as the human voice of voice as in instrumentation, because one of the things we also notice in even in African music and aspects of that has pre been preserved in the diaspora is how sometimes the human voice merges with the voice of the instrument. Like for instance, the, the mandate flutist, Jelly, when he's singing, he, he, 
he vocalizes over the flute as he is playing it. Today, a lot of people do that, manipulate that now in orchestra, you know, in Western flute, flute music, right? And they think they are being innovative, but that has always been part of African uh, way of performance. Or the inanga, you know, the whispering inanga, where you see voice merging with the human voice, merging with the voice of the instrument. The implication is that when you talk about voice and vocality in the African music and African diaspora music, and I mean, I've you talk about the flute, talk about the inanga, chatoche, you can also even see it in the development of blues strings, like the slide guitar, right? Which emerged from the diddly bow and all of that. Vocality in black world aesthetics is not just the human voice. It's much more than that. And therefore what is important when you're talking about that, that in terms of aesthetics and aesthetics differential is that we must not think about it from through the perspective of Western art music, like say the bel canto, <laughs> right? But think about voice because voice means different thing in Africa and in the black world than voice in Western art music. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, what I'm getting from this is that the, the musician artist is internalizing vocal expression and also that the heart and the mind of the performer is so connected to a larger story either in the present or in the into the future perhaps even what i'd like to do before we get into historical context i'd like to ask you what are people's attitudes about the singer um, because i feel like in this society where i've grown up People get a lot of attention for virtuosic abilities on instruments, but the singer, you know, they'll just say, are you a musician or are you a singer? I used to hear this, you know, and my mom was a choral teacher, so I had a different idea of it and it always seems so perplexing to me, but I would like to know, well, how do people feel about the singer in these communities? Do they, do you think it's different? Um, or special, or is there intensity of attention to the singer when the singer steps forward? What could you say about that? Yeah, if I may begin again, again, this is the part of the aberration that came out of the Enlightenment, thanks to Kant and Hegel, and the emergence of the concept of absolute music. But then if you go into the history of Western music pre-1750, right? Where did we where did it all where do we normally begin? We begin from the chants. Right? And then move from the chants to the development of the Fobodon, which is the Cantus Femus, forming the, the chant, the original chants forming the Cantus Femus for the organum, and then the which is the emergence of polyphony. So vocal music preceded instrumental music for a long time before the introduction of instruments into music in the church. So Western art music, as we know it today, developed in the, Christ, in the church, and it was primarily voice. If you look at several series of papal legislations and, and the documents of... Uh, of, uh, of synods. A lot of instruments that we play in the churches today were prohibited, including the organ. But it was only with the enlightenment, with the, you know, the, the emergence of uh, rationalist thinking and German idealism that we now came up with the idea of the absolute music, moving away from programmatic music. And because of what has developed in the, the domain of science, what we call the positivist, positivism movement and objectivist idealism that now begin to think about music as, so this idea of the absolute music becomes music that is not programmatic, that is not saying anything to anybody other than what you have composed, right? So that aberration is part of what has endured so much that 
I've even as a church music director, I perform with my choir and the priest stays on the altar. Oh, we thank the choir and the musicians. Like, what what the heck am I doing here? So that's that's an aberration. It's, it's it doesn't even hold water logically, even in Western music. How much more in African context where the concept of music in Africa and in the black world does not even translate exactly as music in the West, in the Western sense. Because like, again, like I said, quoting Kofi Agao, language and speech is fundamental to musicality in African context. And for that very reason, you can hardly say, see anybody who says, I'm a musician just because I play an instrument and to the exclusion of somebody who sings because whether you're singing or playing or dancing, a lot of times in most African languages, the word is the same, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, whereas in Western music, even dance is separated. Here I'm in the College of Music, but we have theater and dance in the College of Arts and Sciences. <laughs> mm. It's interesting because I don't, <laughs> I definitely come from, the school of thought and practice, uh, and particularly in my community and uh, African American community at large, where you don't draw these distinctions between the voice and the instrument. In fact, like uh, Dr. Okibo, as you stated, you know the idea of this really organic unity is that the instruments imitate the voice. The voice uh, is, in fact, if you think about Ella Fitzgerald or some of that nature, it, the voice also in, in, imitates. The instruments, right? So there's this organic type of or fluence, fl maybe fluidity, if you would. I think that's fluidity, the word. Yes. Mm -hmm. And and so, but in practice, as someone who has like played in rhythm and blues, jazz, soul, pretty much the, the a full terrain within the African-American music continuum, there are distinctions that are often articulated. Oh, that's a vocalist. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a singer, which has connotations to it amongst instrumentalists. Oh, well, you know, they must not read music. Even to the point that they must not be able to learn the real, the, the set, like they're coming with a deficit to the set. So there's these ideals about what it means to be a vocalist within this, and nobody's, it's kind of this tacit understanding or this tacit reflection uh, uh, amongst musicians. It's not a true understanding, by the way. It's, it doesn't really, it doesn't reflect how things really transpire on the stage or in the community when we articulate music and performance. But then there are vocalists uh, who are able to rise to the level of musician. Rise to the level of musician. They're able to hang with the instrumentalist. They're able to sing like an Ella Fitzgerald or a Sarah Vaughan or a Louis Armstrong that they can become an instrument in and of themselves within their, vo their vocal uh, expressions. Um, they can be just as prepared and demonstrate that to the instrumentalists. So there's this dichotomy between instrumentalists and vocalists. And so how we define that amongst musicians. And, and then also noting that in spaces like the Black church, where the vocalists are usually at the forefront, they are the front line as opposed to jazz, where the instrumentalists are at the front line. The, tr the trumpet, saxophone, and trombone of the jazz combo. Here in the church, in the Black church, it's the vocalists that are at the forefront. And so that might shift the perception of how they're viewed in terms of their importance because they're often driving the service in many ways, you know, leading the songs and uh, setting up the songs, talking about the songs, contextualizing the songs before they're sang. So they wait, they, it depends on, I think, the role of the instruments in each in each setting in terms of how they're viewed, um, the significance that is applied to them. Uh, but I think we just really, and, and that's been a, because I'm both a vocalist and an instrumentalist, I've felt in real time 
or at least, at least experience this dichotomy in, in 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 real time in terms of how people think about um, what it means to 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 be a vocalist. And I don't know that that'll ever be resolved in, in this, this this dichotomy. I don't know that it'll. I don't think it will go away because oftentimes yeah. instrumentalists are moving from the standpoint of the Western European idea about what it means to be a musician. But, but now you have hit the point, and that's what I was hoping to for you to arrive at, or perhaps I'll make that contribution because um, living in this Western Hemisphere in a cultural space does have a way of infiltrating the cultural mindset of the black of, of the black person too especially when it comes to stage music right but right. what is happening in the black church like you have rightly pointed out where the vocalists are at the forefront has a lot to tell us also the way music is imagined musical imagination in the black community as opposed to stage performance that has that has um um has been impacted by a Western musical imagination. That's two, those are two important distinctions that we must keep at the back of our mind. Is it gonna go away? I don't think so. It, I don't think it will necessarily go away, but as scholars, it is uh, it behooves us uh, to, to understand those differentials and keep them uh, there as, as a matter of cultural knowledge uh, and to help people appreciate what is happening uh, when it comes to uh, ideals and preferences. Yeah. It's very fruitful answers. Thank you and great analysis. So what I'd like to move into next is a person's relationship. You can speak either as a performer yourself or what you know about some other performers. What is um, a performer who especially is gravitating toward vocal expression what do you think their relationship is to the past? And do you have any examples or ideas about how people either um, continue something from the past or maybe they are breaking forward, um, breaking away from some trends based on a new perspective? So this is kind of a historical discussion. What are people's relationship to the past and or in the moment in which they live and what are touch upon what are the things that might influence a, a performer in the decisions they make as a performer or even how they render their own um, expressive selves as a vocalist. Does that make sense? Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah it does. I, I, I'll, I'll speak primarily from my own experiences because I, I hate codifying performance, to be honest with you. Uh, because particularly in the African-American tradition, we have renditions, right? Where you hear me sing, today I got the blues, today, and you come back tomorrow, it's going to be a different song. <laughs> and so, and, and that's a reflective of this the practice, the performance practice within the Black music tradition where uh, we have a host of sonorities that we pull from, a host of experiences that we pull from in the moment, in real time. We make decisions in the split second. And now, and we're not only making these decisions um, uh, from just you know singular or, or some arbitrary decisions, we're making decisions based on what the other performers in the space are giving us, meaning the other performers, the audience. The audience and the performer become one organic entity in performance within the African-American music tradition. So when you give me, you better sing, Tyron. You better play, Tyron. You better say that note. You better sing that lyric. Did I give you repetition? I may give you a melisma or what they call a run, two notes on one syllable. Uh, amazing grace, amazing grace. Oh, the more the audience gives me, the more I give them back. So there's this give and take. There's this give and take. The audience then is therefore not only evaluating my performance, they're actually informing my performance. Right? So the decisions that I make are based on that relationship 
that I have within myself, between other instrumentalists or vocals on the stage, and outward and inward uh, between me and the audience, right? Where it's this constant, I would call it a meta communication going on. And all of this has to happen in real time. Now this don't happen in Mozart. <laughs> the note is the note and the note shall be the note for the duration of the note. <laughs> yeah. But a, 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 a Garth Brooks' Amazing Grace is different from Aretha Franklin's Amazing Grace. Garth Brooks' Amazing Grace is like about three minutes and some odd change. Aretha Franklin's Amazing Grace is 10 minutes long. And it's because of all of these tools within this performance practice that we have to pull from. Number one, the, the slurs, the bends, the the melismas the 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 terse dynamics you know we sing soft and then we get loud and and you know and then you know it's so many things that we pull from and then so many things that we're given in real time from the audience so aretha franklin can do what they call worrying the line garth Brooks would say amazing grace how sweet the sound it's just nice and even three four or six eight however you want to look at it aretha franklin is oh, 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 oh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. amazing great it's one word it's a 10 minute song in Aretha's hand. Uh, Melanie Burnham also talk, often talks about, and other scholars often talk about these indefinite endings, that these songs can go on for hours. This has been documented in, you know, with the Negro spirituals, the folk spirituals of the 18th, 19th century, how these camp meetings, the slave, enslaved Black folk would sing and, and, and shout all night long would sing a song and it seemed like the, they talk about the monotony of the song. The song, the repetition goes on and on and on and on. And this is what a good vocalist understands how to work within the tradition of freedom. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if I may add to that, this when we a moment ago when we were addressing the first part of the question we talked about the the vocalist as um being the voice of the community the tendency again um i mean this is connected to an aspect of what you call the black world sense of communality and communalism which for western critics have come to look at it as um a cultural praxis and worldview in which the individual loses their agency and significance so that the individual becomes incumbent, right? But it is not true because to the extent that you are as a vocalist, as a singer, as one who, uh, as, who uses your voice to articulate the experience and carry the experience of your community, it does not preclude individual aesthetical agency because within the work you do with, with what you're doing as a vo as a singer as a as a vocalist in music is also articulation of your own experience bearing in mind that the individual experience as a member of a community is not necessarily completely divorced from that of the community so when what uh, Tyron is saying here that with this idea that you you have these raw materials and that are there that you are drawing from by virtue of what is acceptable and what has become norms with uh, performative norms in the in the culture, and therefore you tap into them, you draw from them, you allow them to shape what you are doing, and it's because 
you have individual experience that is that is that is developed that is rooted in that cultural space and that's also part of the reason why then when even when you are articulating your individual experience it becomes at the same time recognizable to other members of the community who form the audience uh, you talked about Dr. Burnham, uh, Melanie Burnham. Melanie Burnham says about that, even non-church goers, let's say in gospel music, people who are not religious in the black community, who do not go to church, who may not even believe in God, when they hear gospel music, they respond to it exactly the same way church goers who create and consume and use gospel music do. Why? because it is not just a religious expression, it is a cultural expression. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it was Pearl William Jones, I think in 1975, she talks about gospel music as the crystallization of the black aesthetic. Yeah. It means we hear in gospel music, and I, I tell this everywhere I go, in gospel music, you have the blues, you have jazz, you have R&B, you have so much articulated in that one particular genre. So gospel music uh, around the world, I would say within and beyond the Black community is experienced. It's become a global phenomenon. I never forget when I was in, I think it was might have been Sweden, Stockholm, Sweden in 2007. And we were, I was performing with uh, Walt Whitman and the Soul Children from Chicago, it was a major uh, gospel ensemble during that time. And we were performing on this jazz uh, 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 it was it was it was a, a jazz event. I'm what do you call it? Of uh, uh, I'm lost for words. Anyway, we were we were performing, and there are there are other uh, performers there from Sweden, like a festival of. Something. Thank you. That's what that's the word I'm looking for. And there were other performers from Sweden there, and they sounded just like we sounded from Chicago. They were able to appreciate the music, but they didn't live the life. They were not religious. They enjoyed it as an art form, like that of the blues or hip hop or you know other forms of black music, secular forms of black music. So even of course within our community, it, re it resonates culturally. But beyond our community, it resonates artistically. And I think Black music as a whole uh, does that. It is a global phenomenon now. It's so interesting. Well, as a result of time, how are we doing? Um, should we bring closure to this conversation at this time? If you wish to, because my I'm supposed to be joining a meeting in the next two or three minutes. That's what I thought. Yeah. We never get to see you. Surely you have some more minutes for us. <laughs> <laughs> I really do appreciate your perspectives on this, um, especially because you are so um, talented with your own musical expressions and your understandings and experiences. Um, this is a great way to look at how music is contextualized both either within community immediately or even a historical span of time so i know there is so much more that could be said but i'm very grateful to what you've been able to add today and i hope that we can meet again soon thank you very much thank, thank you, you all. okay